and um, I first like, okay, <laughs> recording is in progress. So um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Sharon McKechnie and Morris Castell, who will be doing, will be moderating this conversation. So again, thank you. I'm assuming everybody knows how to use the chat. Questions will, will be, you should enter your questions into the chat and the moderators will read them. So thank you once again, and uh, maybe we'll do this again. Maybe the, the counselors will agree to meet us on a regular basis through this platform. So thank you and good day. So, uh, so Morris. Good afternoon. This is supposed to be a very informal chat. Uh, we will time people, but if they go a little bit over the limit, we're we're not going to be con too concerned. Each candidate will have 30 minutes. Um, I should mention that uh, Nathaniel Ward uh, is um, under the weather and uh, will not be participating as he did not participate uh, last night with the informer. Uh, we're going to ask our first speaker, uh, first candidate, um, Julian Feldman, to introduce himself. Um, we recommend something like uh, three minutes, but if you go a little over, uh, that's okay. Go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, I'd like to cover some of the issues I've been discussing with you door to door. Well, I'm running to bring a fresh perspective to council. I think it's time for council to embrace changes that everyone now takes for granted more openness, more transparency, more consultation, and more dialogue with Mo Westers. And I thank the, the library for uh, showing the way. Je me présente pour apporter une nouvelle perspective au conseil. Il est temps que le conseil adopte des changements que tout le monde considère maintenant comme acquis. Plus d'ouverture, plus de transparence, plus de consultation, et plus de dialogue avec les Mo Westers. The world has changed in 15 years since our town urban plan was last conceived. The way we live in Mo West has also changed. Many of us are working from home. Our seniors have been isolated during the pandemic. We're using the town center more than ever. We're welcoming many young families with dozens of new COVID puppies. That's what I discovered going door to door. Our rec center remains a dream, but our taxes are real. Rising volumes of through traffic are spilling onto our residential streets. So we do need to have a conversation on whether our plan is aging well or not, and how we can change council's culture to include more dialogue. To young families with children, I wanna to talk to you directly about a growing movement called Child Friendly Town, sponsored by UNICEF. It's a global movement, Ville Ami des Enfants. It's about formally recognizing the role of young families in our town for the first time and adopting the principles and framework of the Child Friendly Initiative. They're simple and useful. Any town policy that's adopted should first consider the impact on children. And importantly, it needs to be in writing. Take traffic through town. We grew accustomed to traffic during the Turcotte instruction. Rush hour in Westminster then improved during the pandemic. When Turcotte construction ended and pandemic lockdowns began lifting, many of us recognized that something fundamental had changed. Redevelopment in Cote St. Luke has boosted shortcut traffic volumes to Highway 20, and that's now spilling over onto streets like Strathern and Ballantyne like never before. From the perspective of a child-friendly town, diverting traffic from residential streets now becomes our top priority. The town has the power to act today. When Devil's Hill was closed at Broughton years ago, also to restrain Highway 20 through traffic, Montreal West preserved quality of life by diverting uh, rush hour traffic from residential streets and even won a lawsuit giving it carte blanche to act on safety. We still have that power today. I mentioned the intensive redevelopment in Cote St. Luke, but that's our hope in Montreal West as well. <clears throat> Recently proposed zoning changes, however, will increase the density of Montreal West, boosting traffic on residential streets even further. That is three I, oh, higher, Sorry, higher density might be inevitable if we want to hold the line on taxes, but everyone wants to understand its impact on our aging uh, infrastructure and traffic. What's important is that we make a commitment today to transparency and consultation involving the whole town. Take the proposed rezoning 
of the public parking lot on Strathern. In my opinion, it was council's duty to consult local residents prior to making them part of its new densification program. Densification itself, even if it's inevitable, must become a major topic of discussion around Montreal West. By rezoning Strathern, council raised the questions of its future plans for, for the town center revitalization. 15 years after it was first discussed, very little has been accomplished. In the 2009 plan adopted as a bylaw, the town vision was described as fostering a more vibrant, viable, and diversified town center as the focal point for the town's civic, commercial, and cultural affairs. However, merchants say the parking lot is essential to the town center plan, something that's not recognized by the council. Ultimately, Westminster revitalization, town redevelopment, and the rec center project must coexist. One project shouldn't be allowed to cannibalize the other. Recreation itself, the recreation center itself remains a big challenge financially. It could mean higher taxes for every resident, something we, we need to talk about. But we still don't know the budget or what kind of uh, financing remains to be raised to access a grant. Other projects like the town center revitalization have been put on hold indefinitely. Whether you as a resident are for or against the, the rec project in its current form, an honest and transparent dialogue is still necessary. I look forward to meeting you at the door and I'm ready for your questions. Merci beaucoup, uh, je suis prêt pour vos questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to pick up on uh, uh, something that I wrote about in the informer. You mentioned about town being child friendly. I'd like to ask you about what do you do with residents who've been here all their life, but no longer can take care of themselves and have to leave Montreal West um, for uh, elder care? Should, should they have um, a residence for elders in our town? Yeah, I, I believe so. I, you know, I, I, you know, I fundamentally believe that that is, you know, part of intergenerational justice. Um, it's something really that that everyone has been concerned about in Montreal West. It's been talked about ever since I lived in Montreal West. I know people have talked about it for twenty years, probably more. Um, there was always discussion of having a um, some kind of. Uh, uh, you know, independent living home or, or even a care home on Westminster. It, it was even discussed as part of the 2009 town plan, as many people are aware. Um, you know, so I'm a little bit disappointed to see that even though uh, a project is beginning now uh, at the corner of Avon and Westminster, it, it's basically a, pon a condo project. The original idealism of, of using that uh, sp space for uh, where a place where older people could go um, was somehow lost in translation. Uh, we know that the condos will go to the highest bidder. Um, it, it, it's, very, it's very certain that, you know, maybe many young families will move in there, but it's a lost opportunity for seniors. So um, I don't think that it should be uh, lost as an idea, even though the town is small and opportunities are, are uh, you know, few and far between. I, I still think that a council needs to address that um, you know, we really need to take care of our seniors and long, long time more Westers. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to jump in. Um, we're having a little difficulty just getting the questions up on the screen here. This is our problem, not your problem. Um, and I'd just like to remind everyone who's logged in, um, feel free to make sure you're um, muted and submit your questions through the chat function. But we do have a question from Andrew Chapman which um, says, I support the development of a multi-use rec center. However, the largest planned component of the center is a skating rink that will have a large ongoing operating costs and that will serve only a few hundred residents that play hockey or attend um, an occasional free skate. The survey that was conducted assessed the willingness of residents to pay attention at additional taxis for a multi-use facility that included a rink. However, we do not... Um, we do not know if a majority of residents really want a skating rink as a component of the rec center. What will be your approach to consultation and development? Well, you know, let's, let's go back. Uh, if you've seen my signs, I always say uh, on my sound, my slogan is let's make a plan. So we have a plan. We have the town plan. Uh, for the most part, um, 
I don't dispute anything in the plan, in the plan uh, maybe just the way uh, the council is trying to implement it. Originally, a recreation center was in, intended to be behind town hall. Uh, if, you, if you go online into the town website, you can see drawings within, within the, uh, the, the, um, the urban, uh, the town urban program, I think it's called. And you see there's a structure that, that's in a, in a uh, drawing that, that's located behind the town hall. So then, then that plan over the years, uh, you know, the last 10, 15 years, um, <clears throat> I guess in the eyes of the council, why not combine uh, the rink, which does need to be, uh, something needs to be done with a rec center on that piece of land. It's a large piece of land dedicated to recreation already. Um, and we had, you know, if anyone was uh, five, six years ago, um, there was a, a large, I think a very useful meeting at uh, in the music room at town hall where the finances were discussed. But that's many, many years ago. Uh, we don't know um, really what this new rec center um, evolution actually looks like. We don't know what the budget is. Uh, we don't know what its impact on taxes are. And fundamentally, we really don't know in the future how many more years it's going to take to raise the funds to access uh, the grant. The town has a, a tentative um, approval for a grant but we still have to meet financial milestones in order to get that grant. But, um, you know, even as a candidate, I don't know what the budget is, the proposed budget is. I don't, I haven't seen any drawings or any concepts. Um, we do need to have that fundamental discussion. And when you take 15 or 20 years to, to put together a new rec center, you are fighting demographic trends. Uh, we do have a large influx of young families, of which we're, we're very fortunate because it revives the town. Um, but uh, are all these kids playing hockey? Uh, we don't know. Look, hockey is a, an important cultural uh, force in our city, in our town. Uh, it's important to, uh, to uh, I think, to, to respect that. But we do need to have the details from our council. And, and if I was a councillor, I would, I would you know, basically uh, turn it up a notch in terms of dialogue and consultation and make sure that we work on this plan together. Those who are not, you know, hockey players, we, we're asking them to uh, pay a lot in new taxes, but they have to have an idea of what that commitment looks like in order to uh, get the confidence of the people who need to be behind it. Thank you. Okay. I'll move this way. I, I'd like to ask you about uh, the library, since this um, modest, modest. this sure. is all about how the library deals uh, in Montreal West. Um, as you probably know, um, we had a building that we did not pay rent in for many years, and uh, now the town is supporting the library in this location for five years, and after that. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. So I'd like to ask a two-part question. Um, what role do you see the library plays in our town? And if you are a on a council, what would you do to make sure the library has a permanent home? Well, you know, look, first, first of all, let me say, uh, and uh, uh, I love our library. I live not far from it. Uh, my wife has uh, volunteered there in past years. Um, my daughter grew up uh, going to the library, taking books, as many families uh, have interacted with the library in, in years gone by. Uh, it's been a central role, uh, uh, you know, in terms of something that the town offers for everybody. Uh, it's intergenerational as well, which is important. But, you know, more importantly, uh, the town really is the foundation of cultural activities um, in Montreal West. And I, I frankly, I'm shocked that uh, this council cannot give more security to, um, to the library as an institution and to all the volunteers who operate it um, and our part-time staffers. It, and um, door to door, I've talked about that. And uh, I met some of the board members going door to door. And what I, from what I understood is that the current grant for the rec center is purely for um, is purely for a sports complex. It doesn't allow for cultural activities. Well, you know, look, I would say to that, well, maybe it's the wrong grant. 
maybe we need to shop for better grants that include what we need as a town. The library is central to our town. It's not just a place for books because we all know that libraries are evolving. They're changing. They're uh, a meeting place uh, for seniors, for example, for children. Uh, so it, it's something that uh, I as a, as a city councilor, as a town councilor would, would defend. And you know, not, not defend in an adversarial fashion, I think that it's it, it's part of the foundation of our town, and it's basically common sense. So, um, you know, what what do we need to do about that grant? Well, uh, you know, as the town tries to get its finances in order in order to qualify for grants, maybe there are other grants that would include the library. But nevertheless, we can't let a bureaucrat in Ottawa or Quebec City uh, dictate to a town like Montreal West, whether or not we're gonna have a library. And that's the situation we have, uh, the, the terms of a grant that are dictating the future of our library. For me, that's, that's just wrong. That's not the role of our council that is supposed to take decisions based on the context of Montreal West and not the demands of a bureaucrat somewhere else. Thank you. That's great. Sorry, I'm gonna jump in and read another question from the chat. Um, so what, Practical actions will you take to improve the openness and transparency of council's operations and the town's documents? Uh, well, look, I, I, I think that is really, a, a, you know, for me, uh, I, I've been a school commissioner for, for a long time, and uh, I face the problem of, even as a, you know, governing board chairman at my daughter's school, later as a school commissioner, but I was not, you know, in, in the power side, it was kind of in the opposition. I. I faced the dilemma of not being able to get documents, of not really knowing what's going on, of being in the dark. And as a, you know, I, it's funny that as a, as a Mo West resident, I kind of feel, I feel uh, uh, it's changed, by the way, a lot of the school board in the last couple of years. But, but as a Mo West resident, I feel quite the same, in the same position, where um, I, I don't feel that I'm aware of what kind of discussions are going on behind the door, behind doors, uh, behind closed doors at the council. And, and a very good example is um, the the Strathern uh, rezoning. Uh, the people who live 50 feet from that parking lot were shocked. They're very surprised. But you'd think that uh, uh, any city councilor who would have that in their portfolio would have knocked on a few doors and not waited to to an election to knock on doors. They should have been talking to people on, on, on Strathern and the adjoining streets and the merchants, by the way, about that project, being transparent and open about what their, their objectives were, especially since their objectives, as, as reflected in, in this uh, uh, proposed bylaw change, doesn't reflect the town plan at all, and it doesn't reflect the needs of the local residents or the merchants who need parking and Parking, of course, is also needed in order to pursue the revitalization of Westminster. So we can see that when there's kind of a, 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 a cognitive dissonance or or a culture of of uh, you know of you know um, closed doorness for for lack of a better term, um, you know the the council kind of isolates itself because you know we we think that our policies are reflected and, and our understanding as Mo Westers. Uh, we see the um, uh, we see the town plan, and we expect that that's what the council believes in and what they're willing to defend. And then we find out that no, five or six or seven years later, that our understanding is completely wrong. It's something else, something that has never been shared with the town uh, people or the direct stakeholders, like the residents or the merchants. And so I, I'm just giving an example uh, of what happens when transparency and and dialogue and openness is not part of the council culture. And that needs to be changed. But again, it's not an adversarial issue. It's what every uh, citizen of the island of Montreal expects by their local municipality. And it should be part of, of the, uh, should be part of the menu for residents in Montreal West. Yep. The next question is, the train crossing at Westminster and Sherbrooke is a longstanding concern and a disaster for pedestrians and vehicles. What you, you, would you propose to make the crossing a safe place for all? Okay, that's a great question. Um, because uh, again, it's an issue that affects absolutely everybody in the town, whether you're a cyclist, a pedestrian or driving around in your car, uh, it's an obstacle. 
it has obviously it's been there for 150 years. It's something that the, that's part of the town culture. We've you know everyone uh, who who was young here grew up with it. Uh, it's you know the thing is that uh, car use of cars and the volume of cars and, and the population of the town has has exploded since 1885, and um, that hasn't changed. And the frequency of trains maybe a little bit less than it was in the 1880s. It's no longer really a main line. But nevertheless, it's a dangerous place. But let's let's uh, let's talk about traffic because the real problem about that uh, intersection is the sheer volume of traffic that's trying to get through. And so the train is controlled in many ways. There's police there. There's the barriers, etc. Uh, but the main problem is that cars, uh, the cars trying to negotiate that intersection, are are uh, unpredictable. They stop suddenly. They speed up suddenly. Uh, Cyclists and pedestrians, especially uh, 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 students coming from uh, Royal West, they run the gauntlet every day of their lives, morning and afternoon. So I, earlier when I, I made my introduction, I talked a little bit about traffic. Uh, we know that the volumes of traffic are increasing a lot uh, because of redevelopment in, in uh, Montreal West. Uh, the pandemic kind of settled that down. Pandemic is lifting now. Uh, there's more traffic than ever before. But if you go back to the measures the town took at, at Devil's Hill, at the end of Broughton, at the hill, to stop through traffic to Highway 20, uh, and earlier years, some people have told me door to door, uh, also Brock South was also blocked off. As you know, there's a kind of a, an in interesting uh, series of one ways at the end of Brock South, the same, that was an earlier generation. But now it's Westminster itself that is choked with shortcut traffic to Highway 20. And you know, fundamentally, Westminster, if you go further down beyond the commercial area, it's a residential street. But the council is satisfied to allow it to evolve further into a highway. I think that is wrong. Um, um, <clears throat> look, our government just spent billions of dollars to, uh, to create the new Turcotte uh, interchange. It includes uh, a brand new um, state-of-the-art interchange at Saint-Jacques near the Canadian Tire. That is where people should be getting onto the highway. We've allowed um, through traffic uh, commuters to build to sort of create these driving habits uh, that are very convenient for them, uh, coming from the the um, uh, western uh, north northwestern end of NDG or Cote Saint Luke or even Hampstead. It's very convenient to drive through our town, uh, choking off the traffic, spill over into the residential streets, insecurity for the children who live on those uh, those side streets. Well, we have to put our foot down now because these traffic patterns and habits are not going to stop, even though Turcotte construction has ended and the pandemic is, is, um, um, is lifting. So we have to make it inconvenient for commuter traffic. We have, surely we have to talk to uh, our, our, uh, our neighbors in Cote St. Luke, Hampstead and NDG. Uh, they pursued uh, they pursued unbridled development without talking to Montreal West because they always feel that Montreal West will take whatever they give them. But we do, you know, we uh, in our past Devil's Hill, we put our foot down. We need to put our foot down um, uh, on the question of Westminster, make it inconvenient, break those habits, those drivers' habits, break the commuting habits. Uh, divert people, of course, where along uh, Cavendish uh, to the um, to the interchange at Saint Jacques. Uh, some people have noted, by the way, and I'm just finishing on this question. Some people have noted that uh, um, uh, NDG put up these plastic bollards on Cavendish to to sort of narrow the narrow the street to one lane going in each direction. But Cavendish is really is a, is a four lane street. It's a very wide boulevard. It can handle a large volume of traffic. But uh, NDG took action for Cavendish and our council won't take any action on Westminster. Although we do know that, that until the Cavendish, uh, Cavendish uh, extension gives uh, Cote St. Luke residents an option, people will choose uh, Westminster, but, but we need to really figure out a way to put an end to that. Thank you. Thank you. We we have seven minutes, and there are two more questions. So perhaps you can cut it a little shorter. Someone has written that um, they live north of what of the Hump Ridge on Westminster, and one side has no sidewalk. 
uh, it is a dangerous situation. What would you propose to do about that? Well, you know, um, again, it's it's it it really is a safety issue, and I I, I feel for the people who live there. Um, it that's a situation that that's existed for many years, and uh, I um, I noticed that because I went down that area to put up uh, my election posters, and I I was a little bit surprised to encounter that, but I think I remember it uh, vaguely in the past. Um, you know, of of course there there should be a sidewalk. Um, you know, uh, it, you know, one way for for people on the other side of the hump to feel isolated in terms of our you know, our our unified community is to kind of ignore safety issues, especially roads and sidewalks. Um, you know, it, it's very similar, I guess, to um, um, you know the way people feel on you know. Let's talk about uh, Brock uh, going uh, going Brock going headed north from Sherbrooke Street. Uh, where people also use that as a shortcut and people speed down that way. Um, there are speed bumps uh, that don't slow people down or they, they manage to go around them. Um, oh, we need to talk about solutions to that. For example, you know, maybe Brock should, should uh, be a one way south from, uh, um, you know, from, uh, from the hump, from that direction to dissuade people from using it as a, a shortcut around Westminster. But, but you see, when you have, and that, well, just going back to the, uh, the over the hump West, Westminster sidewalk issue, is that these are, these are legacy issues in the town that uh, date back to a time when there, there wasn't a massive volume of traffic on Westminster. You know, maybe a, a, a while back, it wasn't such a safety issue. But now with all the traffic, uh, it is a safety issue. So um, decisions that the council take, takes um, create insecurity. And, and so in order to restore security, they also have to take other decisions. So that whole area was designed with a certain value of traffic in mind. Well, we have to kind of get back to that. But, you know, we also, uh, you know, in terms of sidewalks, we think that sidewalks are necessary in areas where there's traffic. And so, um, you know, that's an issue for the council to, to deal with, I think, as part of its uh, annual um, annual uh, construction plans. Thank you. The last question on chat is, um, how do you, what would you propose to uh, implement the truth and reconciliation um, ideas for Montreal West? Um, well, first and foremost, um, I think there, there needs to be a land, uh, a land acknowledgement at, at, at council meetings. Um, you know, it's interesting. Year, years ago, uh, I was a uh, well. I, um, you know, as a member of the steering committee of Lisa Media Meadowbrook, I did a lot of research into the history of of Meadowbrook itself. Um, that piece of land has never been developed. It was a an empty area. It was a sort of a empty area for the rail lines. They turned it into a recreation area. Later, it went. It became a um, a golf course. But, uh, you know, I don't know if there's been archaeological research, but it's really it's the same piece of land that, that Mo West was built on. And, uh, you know, we know that there was activity by uh, early uh, colonists in Montreal West uh, over on Easton overlooking the bluff. Um, you know, we should find out directly, you know, what, what is the uh, First Nations history in our town? Um, I think that you will find in, in Montreal archives you will find some answers there. Uh, you know, maybe uh, some archaeological research is is uh, in order. But I think that that uh, and I'm sure that it, it's such a strategic area. I'm sure that we will find that we are sitting on First Nations land that was well used, and that um, a land acknowledgement in our council is not just a symbolic thing. It's real. Uh, if we have some curiosity uh, about our own history here, and we should have more. We have a little museum. We should have more curiosity about our own history, but I think that um, that it is real. And the first step in truth and reconciliation is to recognize that and to recognize it in a real way, as I've, as I've described. But also, um, I think Montreal West has a very uh, a respected voice, uh, and we should participate in those kinds of um, that kind of dialogue and discussion uh, on the island of Montreal. Uh, when I moved to Montreal West, and I'll conclude with this. I was 
told that uh, the part of St. Jacques that goes down the hill from Avon, that that was originally built by contractors from uh, Ganawagi, uh, because at the time uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, contractors that could easily come across the river. And sometimes it was, it was uh, easier than getting here to, from downtown Montreal. So, you know, that's the kind of history. I've always heard that story since I lived in Montreal West. I'd like to know, uh, you know, what we owe to our, our neighbors across the river in that sense, uh, where they, they actually were the people with their own hands who helped build this town. So um, I think that truth and reconciliation is not just an abstract thing. In Moest, I, I, I have an inkling that it is real and we should uh, unearth that history and, and um, you know, tell our kids about it. Thank you. Uh, we have one minute. I, I'd like uh, a very short response. Uh, last night, I noticed two, two questions were asked of you, uh, whether it was possible to be both a commissioner at the English Montreal School Board and a counselor in Montreal West. I'm, I'd like to give you the opportunity to, to respond again to that. Right. Well, uh, for, for many, many years, uh, I've been a, a, a governing board uh, chairman in my daughter's school. I was a fundraiser, uh, a volunteer. I painted walls uh, both at uh, Edinburgh and, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, Royal West. And I know that uh, uh, another candidate, Laura Pennefather, has, has uh, somewhat a similar uh, uh, parkour. She um, she has spent many years on many different committees, uh, including governing boards. So really, that's that's part of our uh, our commitment to the community. Um, you know, I I go to uh, uh, I go to uh, uh, school board meetings once a month. Uh, I chair a committee that that meets m maybe once every two months. Uh, being a councillor in Montreal West, I think is is just for me an evolution of of my commitment to to my neighbors to. Uh, uh, you know, I've been a child advocate for a very long time. Uh, I want to bring my knowledge in adv advocacy for children to Montreal West. I think I have a lot to contribute, and that's why I'm running. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, you are welcome to, uh, to watch the next uh, person, you're, the person you're, you're running against, um, uh, Liz, and um, my co-host will take over. Thank you for uh, thank you for putting on this uh, wonderful uh, meet the candidate. Thank okay. you. Thanks. And then the next the next candidate we have coming up is Elizabeth Billen, and I believe great by the miracle of technology in the back room. <laughs> it's changing over. Luckily, we don't have to do that. Um, hello, and thanks for joining us today. And I actually want to just mention to all the candidates, we really do appreciate this. It's a short time frame for the election and we understand that you had the late night last night and you're on again today so but this way we get everyone gets a chance to hear from you before uh actually early voting starts this weekend um and so it's going to be exactly the same with um with Liz, we're going to ask you to give a short introduction to yourself and then we'll go to questions but before you do your introduction i just want to say i know that there's questions on the chat that people have uh flagged to all candidates and we will ask them but we would also rather not be repetitive and so it would be great if um if you have a question please keep adding questions and um, we're going to keep reading them as we go throughout the the event okay so please don't think because there's a lot of questions up there that you can stop asking we do want all your questions great thanks thanks liz okay thanks so much uh, thanks for this opportunity. Um, yeah, I'm pretty tired from last night, but I'm really happy to be here as well. Um, and uh, it's an, it's it's new for you, and and this of course kind of meeting is new for for me and for us too. Um, I have I'll, I'll just give a brief introduction, uh, and then I'd just like to take people's questions, frankly. So uh, I have been the recreation counselor in Montreal West for the last 16 years. Um, I've also held the portfolios of public security and started the environment portfolio back uh, 16 years ago because I thought it was important that we have one and the communications portfolio, which um, a lot was mentioned about uh, transparency. Um, and I was also very keen on that and keen on better communication. So I worked in that portfolio uh, for the last four years. And I think we've done an awful lot there to, to help with communication in the town. 
And I can talk about more specifics later if people are interested to hear that. Um, it was interesting for me that when I first got the portfolio of recreation, it was uh, just the recreation portfolio. And I actually, I actually changed that to the recreational and cultural services portfolio because for me, that was missing in the portfolio. And of course, one of the things uh, that's a cultural service is the library. And uh, there are a few institutions in the town that were so important to the town, but not really included in any portfolio that I thought that should be added to that umbrella. So I also wanna, I guess, let you know in terms of what I've been up to with respect to the library. I vol have volunteered at the library for a number of years and been going to libraries since, uh, well, I can remember and want to say how important I think the library is to the town. I, I'm not um, of the same opinion, I think, as Julian with respect to how council uh, sees the library. Uh, I'm certainly a big fan and I know council also supports the library in many, many ways. And I hope that our collaboration will continue and grow in the future. Uh, I think I'm a pretty good cheerleader for the, for the library on council and I hope to continue with that role. So that's basically me in a, in a, in a small nutshell, and I'm, I'm here to answer your questions, uh, whatever you want to ask. So let's start. And actually, just because of that, I'm just going to jump in because you said that, and, and Morris did ask it of Julian, so I'm, I'm actually going to ask it of you. It's not, it's not one of the written questions, but I'm just going to play the role of the library. It's what I do. And um, you know, it is true that the, the funding for us um, is not permanent from the town. We apply for a grant every year. Uh, we have certain arrangements for this temporary building, temporary, we, you know, I'm just wondering how you would approach our uh, permanent funding for the library moving forward, if that's something you would think of or had thought of, or how you would bring that up at the council. Well, it's interesting because unlike a municipal library, uh, the Montreal West Public Library or Adult Library is uh, is its own institution, as you know, being on the board. So you're your own institution, and uh, we fund that institution like we do other other not for profits in the town. Um, I have to say, as long as I'm on council, uh, the library is one of the most important institutions that we have, and I would certainly pitch for uh, regular regularized funding, permanent funding. That's interesting. Um, could we come to some arrangement about permanent funding? We could certainly talk about it. I mean, for me, I think the library should be as secure as in institutions as they can possibly be. I can't imagine Montreal West without a library, without two libraries, frankly, or one combined library. So um, it would certainly get my support. Okay, great. I'm going to go to a question on the chat, um, and it's the last one. I'm, I'll might go back to the other ones that were flagged for all candidates, but I'll, I'll try and make sure I'm on top of the new questions as well. So a uh, question from uh, Ms. Ullin. There is an old museum um, uh, near, near the tracks, and, and it seems to be inaccessible and neglected. What are your thoughts on this museum, and how could it be revitalized? No, oh, that's a really good question. So we had a, a um, citizen volunteer organizing that museum and manning it. Um, and honestly, he hasn't been well for a while and has not been able to uh, maintain the museum. But that again, that's again with a cultural hat on, I would say that it's really important that we do so. Do I, you know, in terms of ideas I have for, for, for making that happen, off the top of my head, I would say that it's something we have to put on our priority list and perhaps look for something more secure, whether it's a, some a permanent volunteer or uh, an employee that would look after that, whether it needs a, a home that's different from the block tower. Um, but it is a very important part of Montreal West is our history. And a lot of what I've done in my particular portfolio um, is to try to honor our history as best as I can. Um, the Roots and Remembrance Program, for instance, was something that I came up with about six years ago, and that's been going strong. And we put signs in all the parks to let people know where the parks uh, names were, uh, the, the nomenclature of the, the parks. And um, we have 
uh, a lot of work with the veterans program now. We you see signs on people's lawns, and we we that's all part of the Roots and Remembrance program. And I think obviously our Block Tower Museum is part of that as well. So that's really good food for thought, and I think we'll have to bring it up with the next council. Okay. We get a couple of new questions here. Um, Bicycle paths coming from Machine and NDG and Montreal West. Why does Montreal West not have one inch of bicycle path? The excuse of waiting for an agglomeration committee plan does not seem reasonable. Hmm. Well, that's that's really interesting. I um, I would agree with you, actually, that we absolutely need to have bicycle paths in Montreal West. And uh, we have been waiting for the agglomeration plan, and I think we need to speed that up. So I don't disagree with your contention that we need bicycle paths in Montreal West, and I would certainly make that a priority uh, in the next four years to make sure we have proper ones, not just one in the town, but, uh, but other uh, several to connect with the current bicycle paths coming from NDG and Lachine. So I'm, I'm actually with you on that. I, I can't... Uh, I can't disagree. Okay, and then another one that came up, this one is um, about the rec centre. If the library is one of the most important services in the town, why did the council exclude the library from the new grant for the rec uh, cultural centre? Um, this would have been a great way to get young and old mingling and could have been a real town centre. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, we tried uh, four times for a grant. So the first three times, or two of the three times, did include library. We didn't get any of those three grants. And the fourth time, there was a grant available that was just for uh, recreation and sports, not including a library. We applied for that grant. We got it. So we have $12.5 million to put towards this rec center. Um, am I disappointed that the library isn't there? Yes, I am. Uh, does it mean we should turn down a $12.5 million grant? I don't think so. I think uh, the rec center is something that's going to serve not just hockey players, uh, not just skaters, but people of all ages, young families, seniors who need accessible facilities, uh, empty nesters. Uh, that rec center is going to be a true rec center. It's not just a skating rink. Uh, I mean, skating is very popular. Hockey is very popular, that's for sure. But uh, I certainly wouldn't be pitching a new rec center if all it was was skating and hockey. This is a, a, this is a multi-purpose center that will have all of our recreation programs within it and it will serve the larger community. Uh, I, I, I really can't, uh, I can't suggest that we shouldn't go forward with this rec center because it doesn't have the library in it. Now that said, the library's location is important. I think the library's location currently is fantastic, uh, right in the center of town. In fact, I would actually suggest that that location may even be better. The current location uh, may be a bit small. I, I do understand that, but the current location right in the center of town may be better for the library than in a rec center. I mean, that's to be discussed. But um, I, I, I don't, I can't say I have regrets particularly uh, that we got the grant and that we have all this money to put towards a rec center. Uh, but I do understand your point, your disappointment that the library wasn't included. Let's just work together to make sure the library has a location that's the most accessible uh, for everyone in Montreal West because everyone should discover the library. Can I, can, I'm just gonna link it back to the first question because it was about the rec center as well and was to all the candidates. And that question was about, you know, what is, and it's sort of jump, jumping off of what you were saying about what is actually going to be in the rec centre. So what would be your approach to consultation um, and the development to understand exactly um, what the residents want in that space today? Well, I think abs it's absolutely essential that we have uh, residents input in what's going to happen in the rec centre. I mean, parts of it are, are uh, Parts of it are, are, are already assigned. There will be a rink, that's for sure. But there's an awful lot more in that building and that complex because it also includes a pool. Some people at last night's meeting and certainly door to door have talked about maybe a dog run as part of that, that complex. We'll be looking also at the soccer field and how that configuration is gonna work. Um, and so, you know, we'll need to have people's input on that. And uh, we don't just apply for a grant and then say, well, 
too bad you have nothing to say about it anymore. Uh, that's not the way, that doesn't make sense. And it's not something we would do. And, you know, the reason why I have to say, I'm going to go back to the, the communications part of my portfolio. The reason why I wanted communications as part of that portfolio was to me, it's almost one of, if, if not the, it's almost one of, one of the most important things that we do. I mean, I'm a liaison between the town in the sense, the town administration and the citizens. That's, you know, that's my whole job. And so I have to make sure that the citizens' views are reflected in what we do. That's why you elect people. And uh, it's absolutely no different for, for the rec center. Now, how that comes about, we'll see. Is it a big public consultation? Do we have surveys? How, how do we do that? We'll look at that. But the idea that people aren't going to be consulted on this is, is just incorrect. Okay, and then another question that just came up. We all agree that the town taxis are amongst the highest in the province. Is there a willingness to merge with Coates St. Luke and Hampstead in order to save money? Oh, sorry, this jumped while I was reading. In order to save money um, with synergies. Thank you. So you're talking about merging, uh, just to understand this question. You're I'll read, about... Sorry, I, I got mangled when I was reading that. I'll read the question again. We all agree that the town taxis are amongst the highest in the province. Is there a willingness to merge with Coates and Luke and Hampstead in order to save money with synergies? Uh, no, there is not a willingness to do that. We demerged uh, from the Greater Montreal uh, from being a borough with Coates St. Luke and Hampstead. Uh, so we, we actually had that situation <laughs> not that long ago, about 17 years ago, and, and the town voted uh, very, very overwhelmingly to demerge and, and form our own town again so that we can actually have forums like this where you elect your own councillors and you're not electing essentially a borough councillor that doesn't have all that much to do with the town. So uh, I think the people have spoken on that, frankly. Now, that said, it's important to note that we have all sorts of deals with other municipalities, Montreal, Hampstead, Coast St. Luke, we have deals with all sorts of municipalities in order to save costs. Everything from buying salt to the use of, uh, it's a reciprocal use of our recreation facilities. So uh, we do that all the time anyway. We don't actually have to merge with those towns to, to make those arrangements. It's good for everyone to make those arrangements after all. So we certainly do that. Okay. okay. Um, I can. There's there's a there's another question. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of preamble, but I think the main point about the question is is um, what can the town do more to better enforce its own bylaws to ensure there is more public accountability for private property. Okay. Sorry. There is more. I'm so there's, there's an issue about um, a, a property that is is apparently um, not. Oh yes, okay, bylaws. 74 Strand. I see that. Um, okay. And so, what can the town do better? I think the broader question is, what can the town do more and better to enforce its own bylaws to ensure there is a more public accountability for private property? That's actually a hard one because we do an awful lot there, which you probably don't see because it's a lot of this behind the scenes. And I, I see the 74th Strathern up there um, and I know that's an issue. I know that property and everybody knows that property. Um, our, so what we do is we do uh, enforce the bylaws. We give tickets, um, we give warnings and we occasionally will have to take a property to court. Um, but that, in a sense, is the, the only legal way we can handle that. If it's private property, there are steps that we have to legally go through in order to enforce our own bylaws. So the first step would be giving a ticket, and then we can give another ticket of a higher amount, and we can give another ticket. We have to have an amount of space between those tickets, so it's not considered to be abusive of, on the part of the town. Uh, so th th these are all set out legally in terms of what we're allowed to do. At a certain point, if there's no change or the change is insufficient, uh, for instance, we have in the past actually done the work ourselves and then taken it off, you know, added it to the, the property's taxes. We can do that, but we have to get we have to get legal permission to do that. We can also sue. We've sued certain properties that have been egregious. Um, but you know what, that's two, that takes two years or so to go through the courts. So we try to avoid that. So the, the, the issue that I'm seeing here, the question and the particular property that you're speaking about, who wants to take two years to do that? 
Uh, in this particular instance, we've contacted the current, the new owner of that property, and we're working with her to get that cleaned up because she doesn't want to have to deal with this uh, as well as a new property owner. And of course, for us, we don't want to have to go to court. And by the way, people are talking about costs and taxes being high. You know how much it costs to take a, a property to court? You know, you could be looking at ten, twenty thousand dollars to fix a problem. So we really try to avoid going to court. It takes time and it takes a lot of money. So we go through these other steps first and uh, and all, it just about almost always works. Every once in a while we have a property that just will not listen and we have to take them to court, but it's rare, but we don't wanna spend your money taking people to court uh, when it can be dealt with another way, so. You know, the, the the questioner has followed up and asked, with respect, can you speak directly to this property? I don't think this is the forum for specific questions about that. I think it's it's fine to ask about how, you know, you follow up on bylaws and, you know, you've answered that question. But just to the, the, the member who's posted this question, I think that's something that they need to take up directly uh, with the council. And this is not really the forum for that. But thank you for the questions. And we do really want to keep the questions coming. Um, and keep them going as, as you know keep keep the candidates on their toes that's what we're here for um i'm just gonna jump actually to one of the previous questions that was asked to all candidates just while we're getting some new questions um and i think it's um how do you how do you propose to implement the truth and reconciliation calls for action in montreal west hmm, and that really is an interesting question and um, we have lowered our flag to half mast. Uh, that was a suggestion made by a resident and we decided, yes, of course, that's a good idea. Um, I have to say for myself personally, uh, I've been trying to educate myself more about this very issue. And uh, maybe the library plays a part in that as well, how, um, how we can educate our citizens uh, about what's going on, what has gone on, what should go on. I think this, you know, it, it could be um, it could be a, a land res recognition, as uh, Mr. Feldman has suggested, that that's a good start. Personally, I think we have to go beyond that, though, in terms of helping people recognize what exactly has gone on and uh, how we can be a part of the change, the reconciliation. I know the recreation department uh, has been aware of this and has been trying to do more for some time now. We made sure we had uh, in the last Canada Day celebrations, we had an Aborig Aboriginal group uh, performing. Uh, we try to make sure that um, every kind of group is rep represented whenever we can. Um, I think I wanna say that I'm gonna give that some thought because it deserves more thought how we would how we would approach this and it perhaps deserves some consultation with the indigenous community itself to see what they would have us do and how they would move us forward in this in, on that file um and actually there is a question of follow up here but uh, the tea is having uh, the library is having a tea and trc monthly to begin learning about the past um, and plus working on land acknowledgement. So in, in the library, we are actually moving ahead. Wonderful. Okay, that's some information that's on that in the town. That's um, why we need a library. Um, okay, so there, I'm looking back at the questions. I'll actually go to one of our questions that we had um, as moderators as pre-prepared. Um, who do you, which, what part of the population do you believe is most underserved in Montreal West? most underserved. Um, I would say maybe teenagers, <clears throat> because uh, I think uh, through Colleen Feeney and the MATA group, um, we've, we've made tremendous strides with the senior population. Uh, I know we took great care with the senior population over the time of COVID, and that of course still continues. I know that in recreation, uh, not only do we have programs for seniors, but we have lots and lots of programs for young families and kids. Uh, and we're known for that. That's why we have so many young families moving in. That one segment though of the population that I'd like to see if we could do more with or for are teenagers, because I feel like that's a group that uh, 
I just know in recreation, it's always been a struggle to serve that population, to find what it is that they want. I know the basketball court, of course, is very popular. When the pool is open, it's popular. There are certain things that are popular with that group. We have we started a new skateboarding program and whatnot. But I'd have to say of all the groups, that would probably be the group that needs a bit more love from the from your municipality and from the various services when you think of what are the services that are offered in town and I, i'm including in that services even like the library or like the scouts or you know there are a number of other services we have the cra i think the teenagers could use a bit more i think we could look at that harder okay thanks um so also the next question that's come up is, um, can you please speak to the notion of the council having term limits? Sure, well, nowhere in Canada that I'm aware, because we have the parliamentary system, are there term limits? So, uh, I mean, I'm originally from, from Massachusetts, from Boston. And of course in the US they have term limits and, uh, but I do, we don't have them here. So would it be a good idea, I guess is your question, would it be a good idea to have term limits? Well, um, you know, I don't know about that. I, 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 I don't think so. I think the election is the term limit. <laughs> you know, if people think that somebody's been around too long, um, they don't vote for them, you know, and that's the term limit, you're up. Uh, if people think they're doing a good job and want to keep them on, uh, you know, they, they vote them in again. So all that said, I think it's important to continue to have people challenging the status quo, challenging those people in office. I'm being challenged and that's democracy. So bring it on, say what you have to say. Uh, I'll say what I have to say and people will decide. Um, but I think that is an appropriate term limit uh, in our system, our current system. Okay, next question up um, is, traffic is heavier on Avon than Westminster. Could the residents be consulted on traffic calming measures before the street is rebuilt? Speed is a big problem. Yes, that's a really good question, actually. And in fact, uh, originally, uh, we had all sorts of ideas about how to reconfigure that area and put um, traffic calming measures in place, but we held off on that because we knew Avon was gonna be redone. So when it is redone, I would say there should absolutely be some more permanent traffic calming measures in that area. Now you ask, I think if I recall, I'm just trying to see your question here, if you're talking about having a public consultation on this, so that is, a, that is how we worked actually with doing a, a, a lot of the work on Brock, if you recall. Brock South was uh, you know, a lot of speeding, quite a mess for a while. And we had a lot of uh, consultation with citizens there and ended up with something that I think works quite well. So I wouldn't be surprised. I, in fact, I would, I would agree that public consultation of some kind should also be involved in the repaving of, of uh, Avon, because I know it's uh, it's been a perennial problem and uh, we need to do something about it in a more permanent way. Okay, the next one's actually a comment, but I'm gonna say it because I think it's, it's important because it was it's sort of following up on what you said. There is also a citizens group established in Montreal West to raise awareness and take action regarding how we can participate in the TRC in a meaningful way. We have partnered with the library and we hope we can partner with the town to do more, especially since the 2015 TRC report called on every community to participate and respect calls to action. So I think it's just, it's just more yeah. awareness here and more awareness is always great. Okay. No, I think that's great. So Desiree, please contact us uh, and we will talk. Great. That's a great idea. So we're down to the last five minutes. Uh, there's one more question here, but that doesn't mean people can't keep um, submitting questions. I just want to uh, let Liz know, give you a little, a little um, time check there. Um, can you speak to your position regarding environmental initiatives? What kind of green alternatives other than bike paths, current composting services, et cetera, do you have in mind? Thanks very much for that question. Yes, that's probably, um, if not my biggest passion, my second biggest passion is the environmental uh, cause and initiatives. I, you know, that's our existential crisis of the moment. Uh, we think it's, we think it's COVID, but no, it's, it's, it's the environment. So what would I like to see going forward? 
Uh, I would like to see us transition to an, uh, an electric vehicle fleet, for instance. I think uh, there's no reason we should be using fossil fuels in our, in our fleet. I understand it would be, have to be a transition, but I feel like uh, we need to be going in that direction. I would like to see the town and all of its buildings uh, um, get out of the habit of using fossil fuels uh, for, for its heating, uh, whether it's the town hall or uh, the, you know, the, the community center, all of our buildings should be uh, using electric heat, heat sources and not fossil fuels. I would like to encourage citizenry as well uh, to try to break that habit and uh, move away from fossil fuels. Uh, that's an education piece. Um, we need to do better with our organic waste collection because we've got about 60% of the town that are using that uh, organic waste pickup, but we need to get the other 40% on board. We can be doing better with that. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, Meadowbrook, it was mentioned earlier uh, in the hour, uh, not only stays green, but becomes a park. I think we need to fight for that initiative uh, and help Les Amis de Meadowbrook to move forward with that because uh, that's a huge green space that needs to be preserved and protected. Um, what else? I would say besides bike paths, we need to do something about uh, fireplaces and the burning of wood in the town. That isn't just necessarily take away people's fireplaces, but I think uh, Montreal West is one of the few municipalities that still does not have, I think, proper regulations on that front. And we need to do something in that regard to move forward on that file and see that uh, we are not uh, the cause of spewing more of uh, the fuel, uh, fossil fuel into the, um, into the atmosphere. So I know I have to wrap it up. But we can talk and I'll we'll chat about more if you like. Okay, and just because this other comment came up and it has fallen up in years, we've still got two minutes, but uh, Desiree has come in and has said, um, would there be some thought given to green, a youth green uh, team? This is based on the fact that teenagers are being um, underserved. Um, so the um, environment and youth would some thought be given to creating a youth green team deployed to all town and community events and more other ideas. That is a fabulous idea. And of course it combines two real needs in the community. So that would be awesome. And I would be totally on board for something like that. Um, in fact, you know what? I don't wanna say it's in their hands because it shouldn't just be in their hands, young people's hands, it's in our hands. We bloody messed it up. Um, but they are very passionate. Young people are very passionate about um, about keeping us green or getting us greener, and uh, they would be a huge asset in, in that regard. So I would be delighted to 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 um, I would be delighted to work with you on a project like that. That would be almost like a dream of mine. So thanks very much for suggesting that. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, um, uh, Liz, for for taking the time today. Again, thanking all the candidates. Uh, the next candidate we have is Eric Aberman. And um, so uh, again, Liz, you're welcome to stay, but uh, you'll be muted and we're, we'll move your screen to the back and bring Eric forward. Thanks for your time. And Morris is gonna take over the next section. Thank you. It might be time for a cup of tea, but uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for the cup of tea, but feel free to have a cup of tea while you're waiting. Is Eric there? Yes, I am. Hi. So introduce yourself. I can tell you when five minutes are up or you can go all day, but your call, you have half an hour. All right. Well, thank you. And, and thank you, Sharon and Maurice, for, and everyone at the Montreal Public West Library for organizing this event and for everybody for joining us today. You know, it's really my pleasure to have the opportunity to meet all of you and speak to all of you. Um, what most of you all probably don't know about me is that my mother received her master's in library sciences from McGill, and, and I spent a good deal of my childhood at various libraries that she worked and volunteered at. Um, because of this, the, the importance of libraries and, and supporting the public library is really not lost on me. I understand its pivotal role that it has in our society, one that not only encourages the spread of knowledge, but also brings us together as a community with events such as this one and the other wonderful programming uh, that you offer. The benefits of having a successful public library reach people of all ages from our youngest to our most experienced residents. You know, as I was saying on our Meet the Candidate session last night, Montreal West is heading towards a time of change 
And because I can and want to help our town navigate through these times, that's why I decided to run for town council. The upcoming redevelopment of the rec center and the need to increase our tax revenue by attracting more commerce and development to our town will require decisions that will shape our community for years to come. My professional and educational experience will help the council to face these decisions. My education provided me with an extensive training in the practice of private public partnerships. They require that private developers work with municipalities so that all new developments proceed with the municipalities and residents' best interest in mind. This includes issues such as sustainable development, changes in traffic patterns, and increased enrollment in local schools. Professionally, I've been directly responsible for ground up development. So this means the entire development process from rezoning to the installation of infrastructure, from civil works such as pipes, sewers, and utilities to the construction of homes. In my work with communities, I've always taken their historic nature and unique characteristics into consideration. I really do not believe in fitting round pegs into square holes. My past projects have included the redevelopment of a country club and its facilities, the community center, swimming pools and tennis courts in Florida, as well as the construction of homes. Additionally, I was responsible for the management of a portfolio of 500 apartments on the island of Montreal. As with rental, many rental buildings on the island, the ones under my care were older, more mature buildings, similar to what we see here in our town. I have firsthand technical and practical knowledge of maintaining these aging properties and the challenges that often come with it. My projects have required me to work with various municipalities, both here and in the United States. And I've witnessed both the success and shortcomings of municipal governments. <laughs> I intend to bring the best practices that I have seen from these municipalities to our town. One of the many reasons my family decided to make Montreal West our home is the safety it provides. I've lived in multiple cities and I really haven't come across a public security team that's as friendly and helpful as ours. I look forward to the opportunity to work with them and to ensure our town stays safe. Safety and security, after all, is one of my top priorities. I also bring a fresh set of eyes and perspective to some of our town's long lasting issues, such as traffic. I've been involved in the study and implementation of traffic calming devices, and I can contribute with creative solutions to our issues, especially along Westminster and Avon and the overflow it causes on adjacent streets. I'm fiscally responsible. I don't like to spend money unnecessarily, but I do understand that sometimes invested is needed to maintain and improve our town for the long-term benefits of all of us residents. I'm experienced in working in teams and always have time for new ideas and opinions. I do not believe that any one person has the answer to our town's problems. It is only through open dialogue and learning from each other's experiences that we could find sustainable solutions that will benefit our town for years to come. My real world experience in development, construction and property management is something that our council is in need of as we enter this period of change. I understand change can be frightening and it's often met with resistance, but without change, there really is no progress. I look forward to addressing all your questions and concerns today and hope that I'll be allotted the opportunity to work with you to help ensure our great town stays that way over the next four years as your representative on our town council. It might not be five minutes, but uh, I like doing things short and sweet and to the point. So what we're here for today is really your questions and so I can answer some of them. So let me have them. Okay, so the first question, uh, and I'd like to encourage people to uh, submit questions to Eric. Uh, the first question is, in Montreal West, sports and rec recreation get a lot of attention. But as noted by uh, Councillor Yulin, culture is also part of the recreation um, portfolio. What is your vision for culture and cultural institutions such as libraries for the town? That, that's a great question, Joanna, and thanks for asking it. And you're absolutely right. Um, and I guess Councillor Ullen, I'm sorry I, I didn't catch your entire presentation, um, is also right that, that it is, culture is part of the recreation portfolio, uh, whether that be a drama club that I know that the, the library hosts, or whether it be musical programs or, or anything like that. They're, they're very important for all ages, um, for the youth to get exposed to it and to, to fall in love with it. And, and as we grow older, to, to keep in touch with, with the things that we've loved growing up. Um, I think that our town does well thus far in offering cultural um, events to the town. And I think that we could do more. And working on, on the town council, I would, like I said, I would be open to hearing all suggestions and ideas and, and working with people to make sure that uh, these culture institutions thrive and succeed uh, under our, our leadership. 
still waiting for questions, uh, but uh, we'll we'll do uh, some of the questions that were asked of all candidates about the truth and reconciliation. Uh, how would you, um, as a counselor, uh, uh, participate? How would I participate? I think that for myself, the, the best way for me to participate is, is to listen, to listen to stories that people have suffered through and, and to learn from them. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of cultures, a lot of ethnicities have gone through some very difficult times um, over the, our history and, and what's happened with our residential schools and, and to our native population is one of them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of, of spending most of my life not being aware of residential schools. And I was shocked just as everybody else was at, at the relevations that, that have been coming out the last six to eight months. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so for me, with the truth and reconciliation, it's really about learning and, and listening and, and being there to support them and, and to show empathy and sympathy towards these travesties that have happened to them over the course of the history, as well as to, to anybody that, that's been a victim of it. And uh, that's, that's how I would approach the truth and reconciliation. Um, I would like to invite speakers knowledgeable of it to the town to, to speak to us, to teach us, to, to let us know their experiences because without understanding and, and learning about it, the, we can't move forward and we can't make things better. That, that's how I would approach it. If you were going to have priorities, things that you want to see changed in the town, what would be your first and second priority? Well, the first priority, um, I think that Councillor Ulan and the rest of the councillors have worked extremely hard to get the funding for the, the rec center. And that, that's a huge priority for me to, to push forward on, um, not to steal thunder from the, the councillors that have worked so diligently to get us to where we are today, but, but to have my voice lend my voice to them and my experience to make sure that the, the project gets across the finish line properly. Um, to be honest with you, for my, my second priority, since moving here, I've, I've found the town nothing but, but friendly and welcoming. The facilities are, are fantastic. The parks are great. Um, I would like, uh, my second priority would just be to, to listen, to listen to more of the concerns of the, of the, the residents so we don't just get stuck on traffic and rec center and, and dog parks, but to, to really see what, what drives us, what we want to see, how we want to see our, our town five years from now, 10 years from now, because we can't wait for five or 10 years to start taking steps towards those goals. We have to start, start immediately. So someone has actually asked a question about um, the rec center. I thought I would repost the question uh, uh, okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm having trouble. The computer is a little far from me. Does it make sense to you to include a skating rink as such a large component of the rec center, considering the cost of operating over a long term and the small numbers of residents that play hockey or team or free skate? Thank you, Angie, for the question. And, and to answer it quite directly, yes, I, I think that it does make sense to have a skating rink as such a large component of the rec center. And the primary reason for that is that the funding that we've received, the grant that we've received to build the, the rec center is specifically for the hockey rink. The $12.5 million that have been granted to us is not for a rec center. It's not for a gym. It's not for activity rooms. It's for the skating rink. With the money that we could put towards the skating rink, we can afford to build a rec center that will that will fill the needs of all of our residents, whether they play hockey, go to free skate or not. So the the skating without the skating rink, the grant isn't there, and our project, the project that our counselors have fought and worked very hard on, falls apart. So for that question, yes, I, I do think that it's important. Secondly, in terms of the small numbers of residents that that play hockey or free skate, part of the thing about having a hockey arena is that you could open it up to our our neighboring towns and it could become a revenue generating uh, enterprise for the town to help with those maintenance costs. So I hope that answers your question. So another question has come in. Um, it's similar to um, one that we really had with someone else. I asked the same question about 
um, the dangerous uh, train cross crossing on Sherbrooke and Westminster. It's almost impossible for cars to turn left from Sherbrooke to cross the tracks, as well as cars to turn left from Westminster onto Sherbrooke. The city traffic policies do little to control the traffic at this busy intersection. It is a serious, it is, it is a serious place for uh, pedestrians to cross. Uh, I have witnessed many near misses, um, near miss fatal accidents. What would you propose to do to make this a safe for all? That is that is a very important question because, to be honest with you, that intersection is one of the busiest in, in all of Canada for um, for its size. We have about sixty two trains that go by a day and about thirteen thousand vehicles a day at that intersection. Um, the way that it's laid out now with the left turn from Westminster to Sherbrooke, from Sherbrooke onto Westminster, it's not ideal. Um, unfortunately, there's not really any easy answer to that because of the train and, and because the, the roads weren't really meant to hold the number of cars that go through it every day. I would work, as, as our current councillors do, I, I would work closely with EXO and with their construction of, of new entrances to their train station to make sure that in the future, moving forward, we have alternate routes, whether that be the extension of West Broadway, whether that be, you know, um, a way to divert pedestrian traffic away from that, that intersection. The, there has to be a way. I, I don't have the answers. Like I said in my introduction, not one person has all the answers. I do have the experience to tackle this problem and to bring creative solutions into it. Um, traffic studies will need to be done. Engineers will need to be brought in so that we could really study this, this problem and, and find a, a long-term solution because as it stands, that, that intersection is just too dangerous for a residential neighborhood. The parking lot on Strathern comes up again. It's maybe not the best place to build on, but what do you think about building on the other ones? I assume that means the other parking lots. On, I, I assume that that would mean on on Westminster. Uh, Catherine, please correct me if if I'm if I'm mistaken on that. Um, the parking lots on Westminster are, are vital to our businesses. Um, they need to have parking for for people to go and, and to visit their restaurants and their and their shops. I wouldn't be in a rush to to get rid of them or to build on top of them. Um, I, again, I mean, I, I, I would like to look at, no, on Percival. I'm drawing a blank, which parking lot on Percival? It's like behind, over behind Westminster down, like one street back. Yeah. Um, I, I think that with any of these parking lots, Parksville Milner, thank you. Yes, that's, that's the one I'm thinking of. Um, on any of these parking lots, should we, should public consultation go through and it be determined that, that the lot's best use is not to be just a parking lot, that doesn't mean that there won't be still parking available for, for residents or for people using the businesses on Westminster. There are creative ways that you can make some deals with private developers to build on them and still provide parking for the, the local commerce, which is extremely important for our town. So Desiree has uh, added a little note. Uh, would also add that the skating rink is the one part of the recreation center that is also used by Hampstead and will allow uh, to be uh, access, allow access fundraising uh, with residents of that town. Yeah, absolutely, that, that's a fantastic point. I mean, Montreal West aren't the only users of the recreation center and so you know maybe we can reach out to our neighbors and and ask for some help in fundraising for it you know not a bad idea and todd asks i'm curious to know your thoughts about actions the town uh could take to increase the effectiveness, effectiveness. attractiveness of the commercial area 
on Westminster while retaining or improving the charm, its charm. Is there anything council could do around zoning or other measures? Thanks, Todd, and, and that's a good question. Yes, there, there's a lot that can be done on Westminster for to attract, to make it more attractive um, for, first of all, new retailers to come in and for people to wanna to shop here. Some of the work that I've done in, in the States have been with some very quaint towns. Um, the last town I worked with, with was within Davie, Florida, and they have a wonderful town, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're a Western town in Florida. They they like the old Western feel, um, and they like I don't know they they like they like their buildings to look like they were in the old West. And they've implemented they reached out to local commerces, which I would also do here, to come to a consensus consensus on what theme that was the word I was looking for. What theme our commercial strip could have, and then once we have that theme. Um, whether it be the type of signs, the colors, you know, right now the for the terraces, there are these big, ugly plastic, you know, fences that go around that aren't very attractive. Um, once we do that public consultation with the commerces and the residents, obviously, yeah, there could be um, zoning and bylaw changes to allow for whatever is decided upon, whatever is agreed upon by everybody, to uh, to be put into place. So I'm going to ask a, a question. Um... You haven't been uh, a resident of Montreal West for very long. What made you decide after such a short period of time to, to run? Well, I've been spending, although I haven't been a Montreal West resident for a long time, um, I grew up in Hampstead, which is just a stone's throw away. I learned to skate at the Legion rink. Um, I had friends that lived here. So I, I've been around Montreal West for quite a while. And when my wife and I had a ch our child, it was really for us a no-brainer to look for a home in Montreal West to move to. Um, it has such a great reputation as, as a friendly, safe place, a great place to raise your family. And that's why we moved here. The reason why after such a short time I've decided to run for town council is because of, mainly because of the rec center project. You know, I, I've spent the last 10 years working in this, I've been living in Montreal, working in the States, helping other communities grow, helping them find the right ways and the right combinations to move their city more into the future. And I see a, a need on our council for someone with my experience. And I think that they've taken some, some great first steps. And I think that with the recreation project as well, you know, everybody has, has worked really hard to get this off, off, the, off the ground. I'm not looking to come in to take over per se, but I do think that my experience can help us get across the finish line a little bit sooner than we might otherwise and in better shape than, than we could have otherwise. I, I really do believe that I have a lot to offer in terms of that. And that's why I, I decided to run after a short period of time living. So nothing, oh, that's when you think nothing's there. <laughs> You want to read it? I can read it. Okay, you may be aware that the library was moved out of the municipal building last year and now is in a rental space. What kind of support would you lend to providing a permanent home for the library? I would look at all. I would look at all options, Joanna. Um, the library needs a permanent home. It's it's importance to to our town and what it brings to our town is too important to be moving from one location to another location to another location every few years because the lease is up or because you know the the renewal terms on a lease aren't uh, aren't favorable um i so what kind of support would i lend to providing a permanent home whatever i can because the public library is something that that we need it, it's 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 a community tie it brings us together and and without it i think our town would would uh, lack a lot so what kind of support would I lend to providing a permanent home? I would, I would help if it was finding a, a more long-term lease in another building, I would help them with negotiations with landlords to try to get some favorable terms. If it was to look into some of our own, our own um, municipal buildings that maybe it could move into permanently. Although 
if that was if that was a possibility, I'm sure they wouldn't be in a rented space now. Um, but yeah, wh whatever support they would need, I, I would be there and I would be leading the charge fighting for it. Do you think the council has um, done something very good in the past number of years? What is the best thing they've they've done? The, the grant that they've received to help rebuild our community center is just fantastic work. Um, I can't even imagine what they had to go through, what hoops they had to go through, what packages they had to put together, what convincing speeches they've had to give to, to get that grant. And it's, it's really impressive that, that a town as small as ours was able to get such, such a large grant like that to, to revitalize our, our rec center project. I also think that, and, and I haven't, I've been following the council meetings the past few months. I've looked at some in the past. I find that that they listen, they're polite. They don't just dismiss people for, for their opinions. They understand that every opinion, whether they agree with it or not, is valid. And that, that's a team I would like to be on. And so Catherine is asking, would you advocate for safe biking in Montreal West? I would advocate for safe biking everywhere. Um, I, I think that no matter your age, you should be wearing a helmet. As we've seen through through a lot of sports and accidents, head injuries are are very um, not maybe not be completely life threatening, but they could change your life for, for the worse. And and so helmet safety is is very important. Um, I believe that, however, something that gets lost a lot when we talk about bicycle safety is that bicyclists and motorists and pedestrians they're all equally as important and. They are all equally to blame when things go wrong on the road. I think that uh, an education program to remind people of the signals you use to turn. I know that I had to refresh it. I, I learned it when I was a kid and I kind of forgot them. Um, not blowing through intersection, not blowing through stop signs if you're on a bike, looking out for pedestrians, as well as, as educational programs for, for drivers to remind them, hey, there could, be, there could be cyclists around, there could be pedestrians around. You know, when you're on the road, no matter if it's a motorized vehicle or, or a man-powered vehicle, you have to be really aware of your surroundings. And, and yes, I would absolutely advocate for safe biking. Okay, I'll read the, the next question from Desiree. In addition to enhancing the attractiveness of Westminster, could additional thought be given by the town to diversify, diversify services that are useful to residents so that we don't have an oversupply of some services, dentists? veterinarians, financials, and a dearth of others, a bushery, et cetera. For example, the formal BMO building is accessible and centrally located. Could the town not have purchased that building for a library or community center? Instead, we now have a dental office competing against no less than four existing ones run by local residents. Thoughts on more planning? Um, to answer your question simply, yes, I think we need to do a better job at attracting a more diverse range of services to Westminster. Um, there are a lot of dentistries. I'm sure they're all great dentists, but there's a lot of them. Um, a lot of financial stuff too, and, and, and boucheries, as you say. Uh, in terms of the city purchasing the building for the library or for a community center, um, you know, that's a lot of money. I'm sure that that building didn't get get sold uh, for cheap, especially with with how property values have skyrocketed over the last few years. Um, so. I don't know if I would really be in favor of the town going out to purchase more real estate. Um, we have plenty of buildings, we have plenty of, of structures now that we could either refurbish or reuse without having to put out that initial huge outflow of cash. Um, but yes, I, I do think that there are ways to attract different businesses to Westminster and that would be done using a planned urban development. Um, a planned urban development is when the town is proactive they go out with public consultations with both the business and the residential community. They look at what we have now, what we want in the future. And it's pretty much pre-approving zone changes or bylaw changes um, so that we can go out to the public and we could advertise ourselves saying, listen, we have this plan. We want, this is our goal and we want you to be part of it. So what that tells other businesses or developers is that when they come to our town, while they still have to go through their own public consultation, and while they still have to go through the rezoning process, the permit process, and everything, that we are open for business, and we are open to work with them. And I think that that really is the best way to go out to attract a more diverse set of services to our town. Okay, we have about four minutes. I have, I have a question that I asked 
previously. Um, there are people who have lived here their entire lives and because they need uh, assistance as seniors, they have to move away to the West Island or Côte St. Luke. Um, do you believe it's important for seniors uh, to have a residence to assist them as, as they age? A, and, where, a and where would it be? A residence as in um, a residence senior, for seniors? A senior residence where, for assisted living. Assisted living. Well, yeah, with any town, I think it's important to, to be there for our seniors. Um, a lot of them have family that has either moved away or aren't really close. And, you know, they've, they've lived long lives. They've, they've done a lot and they deserve the respect and, and support of the community. Um, I haven't really thought of whether we needed an, an assisted living program in Montreal West, but now that you bring it up, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's something that, it's a service that we should offer. Um, where can it go and how can it go? I, I would love to, to look into it and I would love to, to tr dig my hands into it to, to find a good, good place for it because it is something that is extremely important. We do have a note again from Desiree that the, uh, the Bank of Montreal building sold at the time for less than current value of many homes in Montreal West. The town has a surplus thanks to a very prudent management by the uh, by the council of Colleen Feeney in particular, could have been a very good investment, not only financially, but for our community. Hopefully we can focus on future strategic opportunities. And that's a very good point, Desiree. I mean, you know, with, with that bank building, I know that there was a lot of work to be done in it. So it's not only the cost of, of how much it costs to, to purchase it, but then to, to refit it for our needs would have also cost quite a bit of money, especially with labor and material costs skyrocketing. I mean, that, that sold, I think, last year or a year and a half ago. And uh, as, as many people in, in town that have been trying to do renovations can attest to getting material and, and the cost of the material and labor is just, it's, it's unseen what's happened to it. Um, in terms of a very good investment, it's only a very good investment if you're planning on selling it. Um, if you're planning on buying it and holding it for years to house a rec center or a public library or something like that, then it's not really, you shouldn't really look at it as an investment because it's, it's a cost for a structure and it's a cost and it's something that you're going to be having to put taxpayers dollars and maintenance into upkeeping. But yes, for, for the future to, to focus on future strategic opportunities. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. The town always needs to be looking for strategic opportunities to move forward. Thank you so much for your uh, your answers and um, your your perception of uh, our our little town. Uh, I thought Hampstead was a great place, also, but I guess Montreal West has certain uh, qualities. The next better speaker, people. <laughs> <laughs> the next speaker is Lauren Small Penfather, and. Uh, you can stay on if you wish, but um, be muted. Thank you. Okay, hi, Lauren, can you hear us? I can hear you. Great, good okay. afternoon. Hi, thanks for coming. Okay, so just the same for you than everyone else. This is, um, we're, hopefully we're just a little bit running over time, but not too bad. So if you can take a short, you know, a couple of minutes or so uh, to introduce yourself and then we'll dig into the questions. But I'm gonna say again, can people please keep putting questions up? And if people had posted questions earlier and they want them asked, uh, you know, they'd like Lauren to answer them and they're still on, can they post them again? Because our chat keeps scrolling around and it's just, it's easier if you post it again, if you really want to answer it. Anyway, thanks. Go ahead, Lauren. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Bon après-midi tout le monde. I am so pleased. I looked into the, how many participants we have and so pleased to see so many friends and neighbors online this afternoon, um, taking some time during your busy days uh, to see how democracy works in our town. Um, so a little bit about myself. I've lived in um, the town for 13 years and have been a very active volunteer um, for the last 13 years um, as part of the Community Services Council, as part of the Young Families Roundtable, uh, Governing Board Chaired for Edinburgh, 
um, and coordinator of the Montreal West Terry Fox Run. And it's about really connecting with our community. Um, and it's been a pleasure. And I do want to say that uh, it's a pleasure to see how much the Montreal West Public Library has evolved over the last decade, um, where I've been serving on Community Services Council. You have listened over the years to the recommendations um, that we've made and we've worked very closely together. And that library really has become <clears throat> a cultural community hub. And I applaud you for that. It's, um, it's amazing and Deborah as well, kudos to you um, with your time with the library and all the volunteers that serve and the staff, it's phenomenal. And I know it's been, um, during the pandemic, it's been a very valuable resource uh, to our senior population as well. So I thank you for that. And I wanna talk a little bit about why I've decided to put my hat in the ring this year um, as a council member. Um, I'm not afraid to say it, I turned 50 during the pandemic and um, I have my next set of half century goals. And it was how I was gonna contribute more. How was I going to be better? How was I going to raise the bar of service in our community? Um, being a public servant for the last 25 years for the federal government, um, having portfolios in environment, um, in heritage, um, in Indigenous affairs, I felt that I was very well positioned um, to move myself forward in the community. And it's been a pleasure um, canvassing um, over the last couple of weeks and meeting people I've never met before and talking to them and knowing what um, makes them tick is really important to me. And I also very much like Eric, um, want to share a personal story. Um, you know, the library for me, I have always been someone who loved to read. And the library for me was I grew up in Beaconsfield and I took my little red wagon down to the library every week, fill up my little wagon with books. And it was just to have that, that tactile feeling of books in my hands, the smell of the pages. I still use a paper agenda because of that. Um, and I think my love of learning has taken to me to where I am today um, as, a, as a citizen that, that loves to contribute to the community. Um, and there's such wonderful memories that are, that are in the, the library for me. So I'm very much in favor. I know the question's been asked. I'm very much in favor of finding a, a permanent suitable home um, for the library because you know we talked a lot about the recreation side of things and the cultural side is super important. And I think Desiree has made a, few, a really important point and a few others um, on the call. I've seen that you have highlighted a number of indigenous authors in your window. And it's really about that learning experience. We have three schools within our community. We have a high school and two elementary schools. There is so much that we can do about indigenous learning. And it really starts with the curriculum there. And I would love to be part of that, um, moving that forward as well. Um, and that's um, a little bit about um, why I've proposed uh, myself as a candidate um, for this year. And I'll cut it there so that I can leave some room for some questions. Thank you. And I think the, the, there's our last question. So I'm just going to ask again, please, please, please keep posting your questions. We do have some that people asked of everyone, and I'll try and look back to those if I remember. But there is just you mentioned a permanent home for the library. Uh, one of the questions there is, have you given any thoughts to permanent funding for the library? Well, that's definitely something um, that needs to be discussed with council um, and see how we can move that forward. I think it's a, a staple and an anchor in our community. I see, I think it serves the community very well. And I know that you've adapted and changed a number of things over the years that have made it more accessible. It's, it's been more open to, um, you know, the generation that we talked a little bit about those that are underserved, the adolescents in our town. Um, and I think it's a great area for people to be able to come and, and learn. So yes, it's something I definitely would consider and something that I would take to the table at council. Okay, next question. There is an, uh, an old town history museum with uh, near the town tracks. It seems to be inaccessible and neglected. What are your thoughts on the museum and how it could be revitalized to help promote local history? Um, so that's, I think, is also part of the beautification of Westminster is, you know, finding those gems that are, are those hidden gems that are already on Westminster and, and rediscovering them and putting that out as a service offer. Um, of what we can do in our community. And it shouldn't just serve as a hub for, um, you know, history and heritage in our town, just for Montreal Westers, but it's something that we should actually be talking about. Um, if we wanna build communities of practice, um, if, we wanna, if we wanna build best practices and lessons learned, let's reach out more to our neighboring municipalities 
um, and why this gem of, of a, a town um, is wonderful in this, is in this urban context. I think that we can use that as well to highlight some of the indigenous um, culture as well, and you know, start to you know bridge that in part of the truth and reconciliations discussion. Um, and we're really good, I think, about being able to acknowledge the truth. And it's really about you know the reconciliation part. How can a small town play a part in that reconciliation? And I think it was Mr. Feldman that said something about um, you know, or or perhaps somebody else about you know Dominion Steel that was all Ganawage, um, you know, that built that in the the western part of Lachine. Um, and I managed Lachine Canal as the director of Quebec Waterways, a historic canal. So I'm very used to running, you know, a small city and bringing those stories and it's sharing those stories. And I think that museum can really serve as a platform to, to share those really important heritage stories of our town. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'm going to look back to, I know it was the very first question that was asked and we've asked it of the others, so I'm going to ask it of you too, and I'm going to have to paraphrase because I can't see it. But basically, the um, how would you go about consultation for the actual, what's going to end up in the rec centre? Um, so everybody knows we're, we're still in a pandemic. Um, I'm hoping that this wave is the last wave as everyone else. But I think it's also given us time to have a reflection on that communities on the recreation centre. And I think we do need to have further public consultation of what that should look like. During the course of the last couple of weeks, it's been a very divisive issue in our community, depending on where you are in the life cycle of, of this town. Um, and I think we want it, we talk a lot about accessibility and I think that culture piece, we have to find a way to get that culture piece integrated with that recreation piece. And I think it really is about comp, uh, public consultation. It's about sharing information and cost actual cost accounting. So we wanna know what the operational costs are, what the maintenance costs are, what the capital costs are. And I think it's you know building a fact sheet that's based on evidence-based information and not on anecdotal information. And I think once you start to share that information, I think that will be very welcome by our community. There's a lot of people who make a lot of speculation or there's perception of things and the way that you can handle speculation and perception is addressing that with a very aggressive communications plan. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to read from one of uh, our questions because I'm not seeing any new ones. Oh, have I got? Oh, all right. There's new one come up. I'll just come up. Lauren, as someone who has volunteered in the town, I wonder if I could get your thoughts on how the town can support volunteer organizations. I find that our town is so reliant on volunteers, but many of them are aging. How can we recruit new volunteers and support their work? Oh, that's a great question, uh, Joanna. And I think, you know, it's amazing. There's a lot of people that have reached out to me of, over the course of the last, um, not just the last couple of weeks, but over the course of the last 13 years about building a volunteer base. And I think it's, you know, where can we find, you know, the utility in having people volunteering? I know that we have some churches that are local as well. We have, you know, two churches in our area. We have a third one that's not an area, but very close. Um, there's Meals on Wheels programs. I think it's really, again, about educating the community of what's available and where they can volunteer. And it's, sometimes it's just matching people to something that they like to do. And I think if we use cultural hubs like the library, um, that could be a great partnership in getting people a little bit well acquainted with some of the volunteer opportunities that do exist. If there's gaps that we can identify in our own community, I know that we're part of the MATA. Um, Councillor Feeney worked very hard for us to be um, an age, be part of an age-friendly policy um, with the city of Montreal. I think it's really important that we move forward on that. And I think we have a lot of seniors that would love to do some volunteering. We might have some seniors as well locally that need some people to check in on them. And I think we could use, you know, the library as, as, as exploiting part of that and how we can connect better to our, to our, um, to our residents. Thank you. Can you share your thoughts on the town's traffic problems, especially Avon? Um, so this question we all know has come up uh, quite often. I appreciate the question. And I think I don't know when the last traffic commission study, last traffic study was commissioned. Um, but I know that working on the Lachine Canal, for instance, we had a number of issues whenever there was construction going down, um, when there, whenever there were closures, um, working with um, building developers. Uh, we really have to work with our, we really have to work with our neighboring municipalities. Um, I would love to establish some kind of a communication, you know, committee that works with our close municipalities like Lachine, Cote St. Luke, Hampstead. Um, NDG so that when things like what happened on Westminster South happened, 
you know, people are very clear well in advance of, of what's going on in our town with regards to traffic. And it's not isolated. I don't think we can look at one street particularly. I live on Ballantyne North and it's atrocious what goes on on Ballantyne North. I know there's been a petition that's gone out with regards to concerns, traffic concerns for our most vulnerable, with which are our youth and our, our seniors. And I think we really need to take a, um, a broad approach and do an analysis, a traffic analysis of the whole town really to be able to make those decisions specific to streets within the town. Thank you. Okay, I'll go, I'll go to my list. Um, in your opinion, what is the most important issue facing Montreal West today? Pardon me? What is the most important issue facing Montreal West today? I think one of the most important issues is, is definitely the safety and security I find are paramount. Um, I live on a street where my car was stolen right out of my driveway a few years ago. Um, there have been a number of break-ins across, um, across the city. Our citizens are, are vulnerable. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have is to work better with security services, with the police, local police in the community. And I also think accessibility. We're very limited with access um, to a number of uh, commercial um, stores on Westminster. And we wanna make sure that our town is safe um, for our seniors and for our youth as well. Um, and I know that we offer a plethora of, of services, um, but I do feel that we really need to be able to make sure that we have accessibility. And that I think is one of the great things about you know, the library and making sure that it's accessible for, for everyone. Um, but those would be the two main areas or priorities that I would focus on. And I will mention this, I'm very excited. My, my own home will be a hundred years old in a couple of years. And I think another you know, key issue would be, how do we preserve the heritage integrity of our town by also making important environmental um, decisions uh, to be part of that wave of um, towards 2050 of reducing uh, our emissions? And I think that we can do it smartly. I think that PAC um, can streamline some of the processes. I think that we can communicate better with our residents on what is involved with going forward and pack what kind of materials could be used that are environmentally friendly. So these would be all, all issues and priorities that I would take to the table. And I recently received my um, designation through the Royal Architectural Institute um, on guidelines and standards um, for heritage, um, which you know, speaks to preservation, restoration and rehabilitation. And I'd really like to bring that skill set to the table as well. Okay. So, oh, new question. What will you do to improve openness and transparency of council's operations and town documents? I agree. Sometimes it might be a little bit difficult to access documents. Um, I work for the federal government, um, so we're very analog based. We're not digital. And I think, you know, having that and it's, and it's costly, um, you know, that digital information is, is, is really important. And it's part of innovation, right, on how we want to treat our information. Um, I'm definitely a person who's open and transparent. I think one of the positive things that we could take out of the pandemic is the number of platforms that we've been able to explore and use. I think this is an excellent tool. I think, you know, a lot of people who weren't able to access meetings like this one today or town council meetings now have an opportunity to get that information. So I definitely would say there's, there needs to be um, some kind of a transition towards um, being able to share that information more readily. And sometimes it's, you know, really trying to use a digital platform for that. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna say to people, we've, we've got about 15 minutes to go. I would like to see some more questions. Um, I'm trying to think about the ones that people ask of everyone, but I'll, um, I'm gonna go again from one of my list. Um, if you could change one thing in the town, what would it be? Hmm. It's, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think we've, we all want to um, maintain the, the beauty of our town. Um, and, you know, I thought about that question a lot because I, you know, it's something I've, I've also been interested in. And I think, you know, I think it's the intergenerational um, capacity of what we have in our town. I think it's really highlighting the youth and highlighting um, the seniors in our town and working better with those two groups. I think it would be for me, I think that's that's really what's something I would like to see personally, you know, and it's, you know, I would even like to take it a step further. And sometimes, you know, I would like to see perhaps a senior and a youth representative that's available to council so that we're able to take their voice to the table. 
Um, you know, we often have people that um, attend meetings, um, council meetings that offer a specific opinion, but if you have that resource of, of youth and, um, uh, and the seniors, I think it would also help, you know, inform decision making around the table. Um, could you speak to your thoughts on zoning the commercial area of Westminster to improve the diversity of merchants and improve its attractiveness? So I think it's all about scalability. Um, we are a small town, so for me that's not a big D development, um, but there are things that we can do to um, make, I heard, I heard a lot of people saying a mini Monkland. Um, you know, I think I talked to a lot of people who had said this used, you know, my, Westminster used to be one of the best places. It was a real social hub. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps it's looking at, you know, how we can, how we are attractive to, um, to some of these establishments to come set up commercially where we are. I think we have some really great restaurants here. I think, you know, we have, um, you know, we have services that are available to us. We have a beautiful flower shop that's, that's also accessible to us. And I think, think locals really go there, but it's really about bringing people from outside the community. Um, and I think it's really been nice. I think I, I see the lights that are there, but what I would like to see, which is part of the innovation is I'd love to put something out there to a university, a local university, like the John Molson School of Business or Concordia Fine Arts and see if there's things that we could do that are cost effective that we could add to beautify. Um, I think what's going on a lot in the academic circles is something we definitely can bring forward. And I would like to, I could, would like to work better with some of these academic institutions. It's a great way that's, it's very cost effective and you get a, a lot of really great innovative ideas. Okay, I'm just trying to think about some of the other questions that people put together about Westminster. And again, the issue is traffic. How would you address the issues of traffic with the, the rail tracks and the, the buildup of traffic here specifically? So during my tenure with um, Parks Canada as director of uh, Quebec Waterways, I actually had to deal quite a bit with CN and CP. Um, XO I know is also um, in, in our community. And I think it's really sitting down with those partners and having those discussions because I do believe that the main um, part of our issue is not just the train, but it's the urban sprawl in the development with regards to neighboring municipalities. And like I said, it's a, I think it's a traffic engineer that we have to hire or have under contract that has to look at a general traffic plan for our town to be able to manage the traffic better. And I agree, there are so many times, and I'm sure all of you experience this, how many times I've almost been hit by a car. I had met somebody who was hit by a car who lives on Westminster. Um, we're, we're worried for our children. We're worried for our seniors. We're worried for ourselves. And it's not something that, can, that we can let continue to perpetu uh, perpetuate. I think we really have to take some concrete um, actions um, with regards to manning the traffic in our town. And if it's sitting down at the table, again, creating communities of practice um, and, and talking with our partners so that we can be, we'll be able to achieve, you know, having a, a more traffic friendly, uh, traffic friendly town, but it's that, you know, that train makes it really, really dangerous. So there's gotta be some innovative ways in which we can address that. Okay, and then actually, while I asked the question that brought together, um, Sharon Frank asked, I think, basically the same question about uh, safety and security um, at the crossing at Westminster and Sherbrooke. Um, is there any, I, I think you answered that. I, it, it wasn't asked exactly the same way as me, but if there's any, you'd like to. Yeah, and I, you know, it's, you know, increasing what we have seen, um, which I would say is positive, is that I think the feedback I've had and feedback of my own, my own observations is that, we often had police presence, but they kind of just sat in their vehicles and didn't really, you know, um, work with the town in terms of traffic. And I've seen them much more active now. I think they were more passive in the past, but I've seen them much more active in taking an active role um, in directing some of the traffic and in addressing some of those traffic issues. But it's really, I think, um, making sure that we have the presence and look, our, we have an incredible, um, you know, we have an incredible staff here that works in the town of Montreal to support, you know, the portfolios going forward. And I think it's really taking a look at that as well and seeing how we could best utilize that resource and making sure that we have the presence of both public security and police services to, to assist us. Okay. There's, it's, uh, Desiree has put up what I think is a comment. I hope she doesn't mind. I'm going to turn it into a bit of a question. Um, she's been liking a lot of your ideas and about the intergenerational partnerships. And she said a great com combination of building on what works and improving what works well and improving on what, what works less well. And I'm just thinking, can you think of an initiative that's ongoing at the moment that's not working as well as it could? 
in the town and how you would improve that? Well, one initiative would definitely be the recreation center. And I'm saying that because when I've talked to a lot of our seniors, most of them say that they don't want a recreation center and what is it going to do to offer me? I think we really need to bring, and we have you know, the other side of the table and I have a 13 year old who's very active. And I think that recreation center, we have to look at it as also a hub as physical and mental wellness to serve both our seniors and to serve our youth. And I think we need, even though it's a recreation center, I think we need to find ways because it's gonna be one of our only accessible buildings that we're able to have those two, gener you know, those that intergenerational intersection actually take place and that discourse that's really important. So if I see anything and I, you know, I'm not quite sure, you know, I have to take some more time to think about that. But I think that's one of the areas that we can, you know, better educate um, with, with that intergenerational intersection, just with regards to that recreation center. Um, you know, I think it's a wonderful initiative. I think we need to offer top tier services in our, in our town, but what that configuration, what that's exactly going to look like, I think we need further public consultation. I'd love to hear what seniors would like to have um, available in, in that building. And I think we've perhaps been a bit deficient in, in how seniors are going to see themselves in that recreation center as well. That's one of the initiatives that I would identify. Okay. Um, again, I'm going to keep asking for questions. Um, and I will go back to um, my list of questions. Um, and actually, I won't. I'm going to try and just paraphrase questions from previous candidates. As I said, I can't, it's not easy to go back in the chat. So I'll think of ones that you, you haven't been asked, but there were a, a couple of questions about um, cycling and cycling safety and bike. Um, using cycling in the town would you have any initiatives that you would look look forward to for that for adding bike lanes or, or, or opportunities yeah so as a director of Quebec waterways um, for parks Canada um, I was responsible for a 14 and a half kilometer multi-use path um, it wasn't just a bike path but it was a multi-use path um, so I think that we need to look at ways that we can definitely connect to some of those key um, bike paths that exist in the city of Montreal, as well as on the Sheen Canal. Um, I'm definitely for that because that will help alleviate some of the concerns with bicycles being on sidewalks. I know sometimes parents, you know, our younger children are worried to be on, on busy streets like Westminster. So you often find um, young children that perhaps are biking on Westminster, but I do believe that will help with the safety and security of, uh, of our town. And it's, again, it's, it's working with those partners. I think um, um, Councillor Eulin mentioned um, you know, working with the agglomeration council as well on that. Um, but I think, you know, bike paths are also a way of, of uh, beautifying. But like I said, it's, uh, I would like to see a multi-use path, um, which means that you can have runners and cyclists on the path as well. Um, so that's something that I would suggest. Okay. Um, and uh, sort of what can, what can be done to increase the accessibility of our town to people with disabilities? Um, I actually, um, speaking to a couple of neighbors on Brock and uh, Ballantyne and um, on the south side um, of, our, of our community and people who are north of the hump, um, because we have, you know, our seniors are dispersed across the town. Um, and I, they had some interesting solutions. It's something I'd have to look at further, but these, there are some mini ramps that actually exist that are not very expensive that you could put over a stair or over an archway where somebody would be able to access a store where they might be having some issues with a cane um, or, or a wheelchair or what have you. Um, you know, it's working with, it's working with um, the Montreal West Merchants Association as well um, and finding if there, there are innovative ways because I know a lot of our buildings, the way that they're built, they're just some, some of the areas are just not accessible at all. But are there some solutions that we can find together that will allow, allow that access um, for seniors or people who are have some um, or mobility impaired as well? Um, and those were some those were some, some of the things that I'd like to work with further with the Merchants Association and, and of course discuss with town and perhaps even engage an expert. I mean, in the federal government, we've been looking at accessibility across the board um, for Parks Canada. A lot of our places are not accessible. Um, to a lot of people who want to visit our places. So I really think it's the accessibility part. And I think perhaps even, you know, engaging a professional in terms of looking how we can be better accessible to serve our, to serve our residents. 
Okay. And then that was actually a nice comment from Desiree saying, sorry for asking so many questions, but really the questions are great. I don't know if she's already gone, but the more questions, the better. Um, and we are, we're just about four minutes now, Lauren, and I'm just, I'm sort of trying to make sure that we get the questions that were asked to all candidates, get asked to all candidates. Um, there were two or three questions um, about uh, planning for new um, uh, rezoning areas, at, you know, the, the car park here or in Milner and Strathern. Um, what would be your plan for or your ideas for planning on, on redevelopments in the town mm -hmm. forward? Yeah, so that talks about a lot about rezoning or mixed zoning. Um, and those are extensive discussions that have to take place. A lot of pu public consultation has to take place. Before we look at anything with regards to development, we have to look at what particular zone and people will look and say, oh, there's a vacant lot there or that's only being used for parking. Um, but it serves our community with regards because we know we have a lot of parking issues um, in our town. And it definitely for me, it's, it's about opening up that dialogue. It's opening up that discussion. It's being transparent in the decision making. And I think, you know, there's, you know, four councillors that sit around that table with, you know, our mayor. And I think it's really about, it's it's not for me to always make that decision. And it's not for my colleague to always make that decision. I think we really need, we're there representing our, you know, we're representing everyone. Um, and I think there's been, a, sometimes there's been a, a perception um, that, you know, sometimes people think, oh, well, it's just, you know, five people that are making, making a decision. But I really think that, you know, a lot of decisions that may have been smart decisions, can we improve on some of what we've done in the past? And as we're looking forward and planning for the future, absolutely. So for me, it's really the, it's openness and it's, it's discussion and it's dialogue and it's collaboration. And that's how you're going to get from point A to point B. Okay. I'm um, just wondering, Morris, do you want to ask Lauren a question? Well, there's always the truth of reconciliation. Where are your views on that? How could how could Montreal West uh, participate more? I will say this as a um, and it's emotional for me to talk about this because um, we've been very much involved in the residential schools at Parks Canada and designations of historical sites of residential schools. Um, and it's really been a culture shift within the federal government and really trying to set an example um, for the rest of uh, Canadians. Um, and it's been a journey. I wrote my thesis on truth and reconciliation in its format as um, the report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, uh, which was under Adrian Clarkson at the time, who was governor general almost 25 years ago. My career has been bookended by the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples and now the Truth and Reconciliation and the 97 Calls to Action. And I have to say, it's taken 25 years. People became illuminated, right? People became illuminated. And it was um, incredible to watch um, people finally say that, you know, there's something that we need to do as a community. And I think there's amazing things that we can do as a community to recognize um, part of our past and what those layers of history and voices are because history is not always easy um, there are a lot of things that we have to admit um, that we've done in the past in order to be able to move forward in the future and i think as a small town we absolutely can and i think that the library plays an important role like i said you've highlighted a number of indigenous authors it's inviting people into our community who are indigenous Kanawaki is just across the bridge. I'd love to see more of that, um, more of that discussion. And I saw that you have a series that is coming up as well. And I'm very excited about that. But we all have a role to play as Canadians. Um, we all have our own education. And there's, there's a lot of actually free online courses, like with the University of Alberta, you can learn about um, truth and reconciliation and Indigenous peoples in this country. And it can't just be a topic, it's a journey. It's not just about one day. We had a National Day of Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th. It's really not about a day, it's about continuing that learning continuum and encouraging the empathy and building empathy and sympathy so that we can move forward and support, support our Indigenous neighbors. Thank That's you. great. Well, thank, thank you very you. much, Lauren. And thank you very much to everyone. That's our session is over. Uh, for those of you, if you, you know, missed it or had to, well, if you've dropped off, you're not here. And um, we've recorded it. It's going to be available on the library YouTube channel, but we'll end the session now. And again, thank you very much to everyone who logged in and who took part and submitted questions. The, the candidates are a very strong field. And uh, this is our first attempt uh, to be involved in something like this. And as I always believed, uh, you cannot have too much democracy or too much information. 
Um, the, uh, the participants who sent in the questions, they were very thoughtful and very insightful. Some, some did uh, excellent work. And of course, there's Deb and there's Dane. Uh, they are the tech people, and without them, we'd be lost. Okay, thank you. Do I end it here? Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. you, uh, Thank everyone. You. At the Thank you so much. Uh, Bye -bye. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.